keep you smiling, keep you smiling. Good try, Daniel. <laughs> All right, so keep going, keep going. It's recordings, I don't know, it's taking a while. You're cramping now. There you are. Well, thank you for coming and welcome to uh, Bioscience lecture number two. Okay. All right. So here we are going to talk about few things. This Democritus is the one who, uh, uh, the guy who was describing the atoms and all that. And this is the last class that we are going to touch a little bit about more atoms. I need to explain you a few things about isotopes. And isotopes are very important to remember because they have medical use. For example, you heard some people talking about isotopes for treatment of thyroid, of hyperthyroidism, for example. We are going to explain that. Okay? All right. So this guy was considered the father of the modern uh, science. He was the one who described that the, the smallest unit of matter or the smallest unit was an atom. Okay, so that is one. All right, so as well, uh, today we will talk at the end of the class, the math review. I hope you enjoy the last math and the, and the tips that we have for that. Hopefully that's helping you. Introduction of body organs. So we are going to talk about the location of some of, of very important organs that is coming for the next exam. So it's going to be a lot of matching in next class. A lot of matchings. So we have about four or five questions, 50% of the exam, 10 questions only, are going to be matching. So we are going to talk about that in very detail. Chemistry of life, definitely uh, we will talk about some uh, uh, molecules that are important in our life. For example, carbohydrates or um, fats, uh, um, a fat, uh, we are going to talk about uh, proteins, and we will see about some elements like carbon dioxide, oxygen. How is it, what is important that for our life? Water as well. And uh, let's start with the chemical bonds. All right, so before I start with the chemical bonds, I want you to, to understand why we are teaching here chemical bonds. Chemical bonds are basically the reservoir of energy for our body. So that means that we are going to obtain the energy of the food, of the nutrients from the bonds of the between molecules or between atoms. Okay. So that energy that is stored there, we need to release that energy. How we need to release this energy? Because the body, what is doing is to break down bonds, bonds. So they are going to break it down bonds. When you break down the bones, the energy is being released. But that energy is not used directly by the body. So that, that energy, the energy released by the, by, by the nutrients are going to be needed in order to produce one important structure or molecule. That is the ATP. Is the ATP, where is my pentalog there? is the ATPs, ATP. So the foot is going to release energy, release energy, and that energy is going to be used to produce ATPs, ATPs. This is what we use as energy, this one. The energy released from the foot is going to be needed in order to produce these ATPs. These ATPs, that is the adenosine triphosphate, uh, actually, we are going to talk today, are actually the source of that, uh, uh, the energy to produce this ATP is coming from the food. So we don't use directly the energy released for, by the food. Right? And where is that energy? Is on the molecules. And which part of the molecules we have this energy? On the bonds, B-O-N-Ds, okay, B the bonds. Breaking these bonds are going to uh, you need to remember the principle that energy will not be uh, destroyed, but is going to be transformed. This transformation of the released energy from cutting the bonds are going to be transformed into ATPs. 
the okay with that and for that we need to know the importance and the relevance of the bonds between molecules all right so saying that let's start chemical bonds all right so here we have in this cartoon we have the the nucleus with the electro with the uh, protons and neutrons protons and not neutrons are equal uh, number right so they have the same number and the orbit we have one two three orbits there and each orbit is going to have a certain amount of electrons that make balance or make uh, stable the atom the first orbit contains maximum two electrons the second orbit maximum eight electrons the third orbit maximum eight electrons the next orbit are going to be different numbers 1836 72 doesn't matter so that we are focused on the first two or three orbits so if you have for example you need to complete and listen to this you need to come have a complete orbit for example first orbit two in order that the of the in addition electrons they are going to pass into the second orbit you cannot have only one electron and one electron in the second orbit first orbit one electron no you need to complete two electrons in order to start filling up the second and then the third orbit is that clear or no it's clear okay perfect all right so uh, most atoms uh, they are going to, uh, basically, in the nature, in the periodic table of Mendeleev, all these atoms are neutral. All of atoms are neutral. Remember, the number of protons, the number of neutrons, and the number of electrons in this periodic of Mendeleev are exactly the same. So if you have 10 protons, the neutrons doesn't have charge, so we don't count that. So 10, neut 10 protons, you have 10 electrons in the in the orbits if you have 25 protons in the nucleus you have 25 electrons in the orbit total so 25 plus uh, minus 25 that is going to be zero so basically all the elements that you have in the periodic table as as, as you see in the periodic table are zero there is no charge then is coming one term that open eyes open ears is coming so what is valency 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 is the the number just to make it as simple as possible but valency is the number of electrons that can be gained or lost depends in order to keep the and why is that depends of the uh, 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 of the stability of the atom so that's why you need to learn orbit one, orbit two, orbit three, two, eight, eight. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. All right. So in nature, most atoms do not exist in the neutral form. And that is vital. That is why, why things exist in the world, in the universe. So because of this difference of charges, when they lose or gain electrons, are going to make charge with a positive or a negative charge. And you know that this positive and negative, they attract to each other. So saying that, that means that that is how the atoms in the universe are going to interact to each other to form other components. That is the reason why we exist. All things around you are because of these interactions. All right. So here we have the lithium, and the lithium is going to have, actually, lithium is lithium-3. 3. 3 is what you see in the periodic table of Mendeleev. Do you need to memorize that? No, I'm not asking that. So I'm not going to ask you to memorize the electrons in the periodic table, no. Lithium, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium, no. I'm not going to go on that. So, uh, so I'm going to give you always, if that is the case, the number that is representing three, represent what? Three protons. But if I say three protons, that means that that lithium have as well three neutrons. And as well, they have three electrons. So if I can see, see three protons, you have three electrons as well. And this is the lithium. Lithium, we have the nucleus, we have three positive here in the nucleus, and we have three electrons on the orbit. In the first orbit, as you see here, in the first orbit, 
the maximum number allowed to make balance or make stable the molecule is two. So that's why I have two in the first orbit. The remnants are going to be distributed on the next orbits. In this case, we have only three, so one electron will be uh, traveling in the second orbit, in the second orbit. So now, in order to make happy this atom, that is that is actually what is the periodic of Mendeleev, right? But in nature, this atom is not going to be there because this atom is not happy. They want to have a complete, a complete number of electrons in the orbit. So this one is going to get lost. So instead, uh, the molecule is more easier for the atom, sorry, it's more easy for the atom to lose this electron and you have a complete orbit here with the first orbit, rather than gain seven more electrons. So what is easier? Easier is going to keep two electrons. And right now, uh, when you uh, get rid of this electron, you have three protons in the nucleus, and you have two electrons, minus two. So that is going to be plus one. So lithium are going to be charged plus one, or you can write it down like this, just one plus. And that is called a cation. Remember a cation? Cation. So when an element, when an element, element lose or gain an electron, they will be charged with some electrical charge. So they are going to become an ion. An ion is an element who contain an electrical charge. This ion, can be turned into cation depends if they lose uh, they lose more electrons or an ion or if they gain electrons if that is the case okay you okay with that all right yes uh, let me sorry it's a it's a coordinator i mean i need to stop this stop since so i'm so sorry i'm going to tell him that I'm,
Yeah, guys, sorry. Uh, this was a conversation about uh, students who are coming, not coming, and then we are concerned about that, so we want to do a follow up. That's all. All right, so let's get let's get continued. Sorry for that. All right. All right, so fluoride, fluoride, fluoride. I think they have nine. It's not my, is is I'm not I'm not wrong. Fluoride is nine. Yes. See, fluoride, fluoride is nine. So what is an example here? What they want to do here? Fluoride is nine. So we have here nine positive in the in the nucleus. We have minus two electrons in the first orbit. We have minus eight electrons in the second orbit, and we have minus one electron in the second in the third orbit. So you already know, in order to make uh, uh, this stable, you need to have maximum two electrons. So we are okay with this first orbit. The second orbit already contains eight, so we are okay with that orbit. So here we have one. In this orbit, we need to have eight total, but we have only one electron. So what is going to be easier for this molecule to gain or to gain seven more uh, electrons or to lose one electron? Lose one. Lose one. And what could be the overall charge of this? Plus one. Plus. Sorry. Negative one. Plus one. Plus one. Why? We have how many we have here? Oh yes, the moment, just the moment. Uh, I make a mistake. Why you didn't correct me? I make a mistake. <laughs> I make a mistake, right? Yeah. Yeah. What was the uh, second orbit? Eight. You had ten in the second orbit, not eight. Seven. Excellent. Very good. Now this is with something is wrong here. All right. So you have seven electrons. Seven electrons. And now. Let's do the story again. It's easier to gain one electron or to lose seven electrons? Gain one. It's easier to gain one electron, right? So now instead of that, you're going to, instead of seven, you have eight electrons. So now if you have nine positive protons and you have total, you gain one electron, we have eight now here. And two, we have minus 10 electrons. What is the total charge of the element? It's going to be minus one. Yes or no? Yes. So the fluoride will become an anion, F1. F minus one. Okay? Nobody get confused, right? We okay with that? Yep. Okay. Okay. We have inert elements. The inert elements, just to make it uh, simple, look at this. We have inert elements. We have helium, neon, argon, xenon, krypton, xenon, and radon. These are called the neutral or inert elements. Inert, inert with one end or two ends. Okay, inert. All right, so in inner, inert, we have two electrons. We have 10 electrons, 18, 36, uh, what is that? 54, uh, 86. So that means the helium is going, this is the helium. Helium, they're having two electrons. That is happy. They don't need to gain or to lose any electron, correct? The neon. The neon is the second here. This is the neon. The neon, we have minus two and minus eight. So because we have total 10, so two and eight is 10. So we have second orbit is complete. You don't need to gain or to lose any electrons. So this is a neutral, inert. They're not going to be interacting with other elements. And that is the point, just to show you that why things are interacting to each other. The last one, 18, we have the argon. Argon, we have minus two, minus eight, and then we have minus eight. So uh, two, eight, 10, 10, 18. How many electrons we have? 18. So these are having a complete a, a, a complete a, a complete uh, orbits with the corresponding electrons 288 so they don't need to interact with anybody so that's why it's called neutral or actually inert we okay with that all right so that is about and what is the concept here 
The concept is that these inert elements do not going to interact with any other element. They are going to be by themselves, alone. They are not making molecules. They are not coming together. For example, I will tell you one more thing. The difference is I hydrogen. If you, hear, if you see hydrogen, I'm going to stop a little bit here because it's important to talk about hydrogen, okay? Hydrogen, number one, why is important? Because you know it's part of the components of water. Water is H2O, correct? All right, so this hydrogen is, hydrogen is the uh, element that is the most abundant, not only in our planet, but in whole universe. So hydrogen is the most common element. So we have here an hydrogen, and the hydrogen we have plus one proton, correct? Right? Because one is one proton. And how many electrons we have in the orbit? Minus one, correct? So in this case, what you're going to do? You have a number that will be equal, easier to gain or to lose, or to lose the electron. If they gain the electron, if they, if they gain, you will have two electrons now, right? In order to keep the, the, the balance. So in that case, it's going to be H2. I didn't put two here because it's not an ion. So they are going to be, who is this? When I have that ring, it's because somebody cannot get in until I accept the invitation. Okay, all right, so let's get, let's continue. All right, Miss, Miss, oh, oh, okay. So we will talk at the end of the class, okay? So you miss the quiz. Uh, we will talk about what are the rules of the school for that, okay? So and what could be the considerations that we can have uh, in this situation? All right, so we have hydrogen. So if the hydrogen, look at this, hydrogen is one proton, one proton, and they have one electron. So if they gain another electron, it will be H2. If they gain, gain. But if they lose that electron here, if they lose that electron, the only thing that we are going to keep is the proton, yes or no? So that's why hydrogens are going to be plus one. Oh, plus like that. Okay? Please, everybody. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay, all right. So why I'm talking about this? Because I want just to, if you can write down this, please. Any element who is going to donate electrons, anything, any element who donate electrons or to or lose electrons, the more electro, the, they are going to lose electrons, that is an acid. Acid, acid, acid. That will be acid. So hydrogens are going to be acid. Hydrogens are going to be acid. Oh my God, my nerves are okay. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the hydrogen become acid. And that is important. For example, you have in your stomach, you have this one, HCl. That is the chlorhydric acid. So acid because of the hydrogen. This is what you have in your gastric acid. Your gastric acid is very acid, pH 2. It's very acid. And who is giving that acidity is the hydrogen. Hydrogen. In your blood, you don't you cannot have too much hydrogens. You don't you you need to have some levels of hydrogen, but not too much. Because your blood can become acid and that can kill you, you can they can kill the patient. All right. So at this moment, what I want you to remember about the hydrogen, hydrogen positive, like this, plus one, is going to be acid. Okay? So it's going to become, look at this, it's going to become. If you have an H here, it's going to be acid. Okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's keep moving. All news here. The all news is 
that valency is the number of electrons that an atom wants to gain or to lose in order to be happy. Okay, so basically you don't need to tell the atom is happy or not, right? But you can say valency is the uh, number of electrons that is gained or lost. That's it, period. You okay with that? Now, if we have here, uh, we have an either, uh, we have, let's go to oxygen. Oxygen uh, is not is my bad here, is eight electrons. Eight electrons. So oxygen are going to have eight, eight protons in the nucleus. They are going to have minus two electrons in the first orbit and is going to be minus six electrons in the second orbit, correct? Now, in this case, in this case, what is doing this, uh, what is doing this oxygen? In this time, this time, this oxygen is going to be easier to gain two electrons or to lose six? Gain two. Two electrons. So what about if I have here one hydrogen? One hydrogen, this is going to, I'm going to call this oxygen. I'm going to call hydrogen here. And the hydrogen have one positive and one negative, correct? What about if I have another hydrogen here? Because hydrogen is have the advantage, like for him is equal, same, it's the same for him to gain or to lose one electron. So you have another molecule of hydrogen, and you know what I'm talking about now, is going to be minus one electron. So if you put together the need of the oxygen to gain, to gain two electrons, and the indifference of the hydrogen to gain or to lose electrons, they're going to work together. They're going to join together. So they're going to have one electron of this orbit sharing to the hydrogen, become H2. And they are going, the oxygen is going to share the electron of two hydrogens. They are going to complete his uh, orbit with eight. So at the end, what we have is water. All right? All right. Because if you uh, if you see here uh, that uh, that electron that uh, pro that oxygen are going to gain two electrons, so we have here uh, plus eight uh, minus eight minus eight. That is actually no, sorry, minus two. Why is that? Because when after they gain two electrons in the in the in the second orbit, we have eight eight and two minus 10, minus 10, minus 10, plus eight is going to be minus two. So that is the charge of the oxygen. And the hydrogen are going to basically gain an electron and the hydrogen become uh, actually negative, and negative, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. And they are going to be attracted by the oxygen in order to complete the molecule H2O. All right, so just remember the interaction are going to be uh, needed in order to com uh, form a molecule. All right. Open eyes, open ears, please. When I say open eyes, open ears, you already know what I'm talking about, right? So open eyes, open ears is the classification of the molecules. The classification of the molecules are going to be classified as a simple or basic molecules. Simple or basic molecules. And the other one is compound molecules. Very simple. So simple or basic molecules are molecules. You know what is a molecule? Is the uh, is the interaction of two or more atoms. Is the interaction of two or more atoms. Two. So to form one molecule, at least you need to have two atoms, or you can have more. So be, uh, do, saying that if the elements that are coming interacting to each other are the same that is going to be actually called a simple or basic molecule. For example, we have this H2, this is a gas. This is a simple molecule. Another is actually we have uh, oxygen. That is a simple, uh, simple uh, molecule. And nitrogen is a simple molecule. Is uh, the helium, the neon, the uh, xenon, the uh, radon, uh, all these guys that actually are going to 
uh, be the same molecule, for example, uh, neon is going to be two, neon, radon is going to be two. Why? Because they are going to be, a, no, no, they are not uh, they are together. So forget about, sorry for that, just stay with this. Because the gas inert is only one atom, they are not interacting to each other, because they are already complete, okay? So H2, uh, and these are components of air, air. One of the components, we have carbon dioxide that is a compound molecule, but the simple molecules in conclusion are those molecules that are uh, molecules that are coming together from the same, the same element. So hydrogen two is, is gas, oxygen two is gas, nitrogen two is gas, all these are gases. All right, so compound molecules will be, for example, water. Compound molecules is that you have one, uh, you have more than one element. Uh, so there are two different elements at least, two different elements at least. So we have hydrogen, one element, oxygen, one element, carbon dioxide, uh, carbon, one element, oxygen, one element. So you need to remember what is a simple, or basic molecule versus a compound molecule. Okay? Yep. All right, so let's talk about chemical bonds. Talking about chemical bonds is a, I going, look like a, you love, uh, you love uh, chemi chemistry, right? Like I did when I was in the school. Yeah, but, uh, Organic chemistry was really kind of not so nice. But anyhow, so let's let's do, I'm, I'm going to simplify and make it easy for, for us. All right, so chemical bond. A chemical bond is a mutual attraction. Just to give you the overall view, and that's what we are going to get in the next minute, is this. Where is my, there you go. All right, so we have bonds. The bonds are going to divide it. There are many, many bonds. Sulfur, sulfur uh, uh, bonds, uh, hydrogen bonds. We have uh, another one is uh, uh, sulfur, hydrogen bonds. We have uh, uh, ionic, we have an, uh, covalent. And we are going to just telling you exactly what we need to remember. Number one, we have the ionic bond, ionic bond. And the other one is the covalent bond, covalent bond. So just put in your mind that you have two elements that are going to interact to each other. They're going to interact to each other. All right, so how they interact? By attraction. These two elements are going to attract to each other. It's like a person. Some people are attracted uh, to another person, right? And the link, how strong is going to be the feelings is what is going to make more stable that relationship, right? The stronger feelings, the strong, stronger emo emotions, you're going to have a more, a more stable, stable uh, relationship. And that's what happened with the atoms. The atoms are going to have relationships, okay? So we have ionic, the ionic is going to be like uh, uh, you're going to have, for example, here some whatever element here with uh, uh, electrons. Let's make electrons like orbits, okay? And we have another element here with electrons in here, all right? So what is doing one, A and B? So there are two elements that are going to interact at this moment. So what they are doing B is that they have a very nice feelings, but they attract to each other, right? So what they're doing, B or A, whatever, they're going to take all the electrons by himself. So basically, all the electrons are going to be passed to the other element, and they are going to basically leave naked the other one, but they're still together. So that is like a marriage. So this marriage is going to be you have two types of marriages, right? What are those? One is for love, for love, for love. And the other one is for money, 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 right? 
Okay, so there's some marriages are going to be for money and some marriages are going to be for love. Okay, so tell me, the marriages that are for money, they are going to last a very long time or a short period of time? What do you think? Short. Short, right? Short. Yeah. yeah, because I marry with you because I want your money, money, money. That's all what I want. That's all what I want. So all, all what is yours is mine. What is mine is mine, right? So it's actually, yes, that is a very selfish service. On the other side, we have other marriages that are for love. And when they are for love, they share everything, right? They share everything. And this uh, relationship is going to last longer. All right, so let's go into a little bit more. The marriage for money, for money are weak, weak marriages. Same as the ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are going to be for, they're going to, basically what they want is, what happened here? Oh my God, oh, I click different. Okay, the marriage for money are going to be basically the ionic bonds. Okay. All right, so let's go here, bonds, ionic are going to be marriage for money. I will hear money, 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 money. So what is happening here? The, the uh, ions, that is the money, the, the electrons that are the money, is the money. The electrons is the money. The electrons is the money. So I, I want you to give me all your money. Okay? I'm still together with you, but I want your money. That is an ionic bond. So these molecules are very weak, are going to be weak molecules. So any distress, anything that is going to, to, to happen, any problem, they are going to get apart. That is a weak bond, weak bond, ionic bond. What is the best example of ionic bond? Ionic bond will be the sodium chloride. Or basically you can call this chloride, uh, like this, sodium chloride as well. So what is this? Chloride and sodium. What is that? Somebody can tell me. As far as. What is this? Somebody can tell me. Salt. Salt. That is a salt. It's in, in your kitchen. That white stuff there that is in your kitchen is sodium chloride. It's sodium chloride. It's salt. Okay, salt table. So that is basically the what is the salt, sodium chloride. Okay? You okay with that? Now, homework. I want you to go to your kitchen, take this uh, 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 salt and put it into water. Tell me, the salt disappeared immediately, correct? Yes. Right, excellent. So why? Because at the minor stress, just to put somebody else there, like water, that stress, he says, oh, you know what, too much problem. I'm going to get apart from you. And the sodium and chloride are going to separate, divorce. Okay, all right, excellent. Then we have the other bonds are going to be the covalent bonds. These covalent bonds are going to be for love. All right, for love. Let's make a love here. A lot of hearts here. And when you have actually that strong feeling, you're going to have a very strong bond. Correct? Why is that? Is the opposite basically of the ionic. Covalent bonds are going to be 
they are going to share everything. They are going to share all the electrons. My money is yours and your money is mine. So we have the same, whatever we do is for both of us, right? And the, in this case, we have, for example, uh, we are going to have different molecules. Uh, there is two groups of covalent here. One is the polar, covalent, polar, and the other one is the no-polar. No-polar. Polar means poles, right? Polar means poles, like North Pole, uh, South Pole, etc. Right? Pole. So these polar bonds are, uh, I, let's start with the no-polar. The no-polar is the one who really died for his partner, for his, uh, I mean, wife or her husband. Okay, so they share everything, no matter what, no matter what, pure love, right? Pure, pure, pure love. So this relationship is very strong, very, very strong. And what we have here as molecule are going to be a molecule that is basically something like this. No, sorry. Uh, and many more. Hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. So you have a lot of, actually, this is a complex molecule that you can see. And the best example for, the, for that is fat. 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 Okay? People love, let's make it like, just to remember, uh, we love fat. We love fat. Fat. So fat is very full of love. The polar is going to be in love as well, but are not going to, it's only just one heart here or two hearts. This is three hearts, right? So the polar, they love each other. They're going to share, right? They like to share, but they are not greedy at all, similar as the sodium chloride. So they are not that greedy. They are not it's totally different story. And the best example uh, for a, just a moment, this is, you tell me that this is not matching the lecture? Somebody's telling me that this is not matching the lecture, the PowerPoint? No, it is. It is, right? It does. Okay, so Mr. Yeah. No, I don't know if you are the one who write me down. That is, check your email. I send you the PowerPoint. Okay? All right. All right, so the polar, the polar will be, the best example is the water. 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 So if you put, just homework, homework. You put a drop in the table of water here and put another drop of water here and try to make it closer. There is a moment that, Look, they come together, right? They're hugging each other. Two drops are hugging each other. It's, oh, I love you. So boom, they get together. So that at this attraction of two drops is the force of that covalent force. That is how you can visualize that, that force. Okay? All right, so now, uh, this polar, so we have, and this is what is confusing for many, so I'm going to clarify that. Look at this. Polar, Polar a bond is a covalent port, a, a bond. Polar is a covalent. No polar, again, is a covalent uh, uh, bond. You can say polar, but you understood that that is already considered, that you know that is a covalent, covalent bond. If you just said no polar, that again, that is a covalent bond. So, if you want to, you have the time to say it, you say co a polar covalent or covalent polar, covalent polar. Or you can say covalent no polar. Covalent polar, covalent polar is the same to say polar. Because if you say polar, it's already understood that is a covalent, a covalent bond. Do you okay with that? Yep. Yes. Excellent. All right, so why is it important to know that? The, what I'm planning to do is you to make understand, and the purpose of this is to make understand why 
how is formed the cell membrane. And that's it look like it's not related, right? But it's going to be. So all these steps is just to make you understand how the cell membrane is formed. All right, anyhow, so let's keep going. So uh, in this case, okay, so just remember this, very simple. Ionic, the salt, covalent polar or polar water, and covalent no polar or no polar is called the fat, okay? All right, perfect. So let's read a little bit here. Ionic bonds, chemical links between two atoms bound together by attraction between opposite charge ions, okay? So basically uh, what they're doing is to uh, take mostly of the money, the electrons from the other atom by himself, for, for himself, so the, or for itself. Okay, so that is the same example I was giving you. Sodium, you dissolve this in, in water. The, the bond are going to be totally separated. They are going to separate almost immediately because this is an ionic bond. So any stress or any changes are going to make separate or divorce these two atoms. Okay. All right, so that is the hydrogen. If you remember here, they share, they share this, uh, this hydrogen and they're going to, basically they're going, this is a covalent, covalent bond. All right, so we have here ionic bonds, ionic, the sodium chloride, sodium chloride. We have a weaker bond like marriage for money based on one atom given or another receiving all the electrons or the most of the electrons, one atom becomes a cation and the other is an anion. Plus, plus and minus are attracted to each other. All right, so not very good strong bonds, atoms dissociated from each other, dissolve easily. That is the example of sodium chloride. I don't use the hydrogen fluoride because we don't use that often. A strong bond, covalent bonds, you know, we have polar and no polar, right? So this, in this slide, doesn't differentiate them, but you must know that for a few reasons. So uh, as, as a reason why I make the division of polar and no polar, okay. All right, so the same thing here. All right, so here we have, uh, all right, so we can go over you have this review, what is the answer of this? Just a moment, let me see. Yeah, it's, all, it's no one space, only. okay, let's see. All right, so let's read. When two atoms for, for, from, uh, form a molecule, molecular bond, is like two people forming a couple and couples interact from each other. Oh, it's, a, no, it's not a question, okay. One couple may like another couple and wants to hang out with them all the time, or dislike them or try to avoid them as much as possible or sometimes just being indifferent towards the other couple. All right, so molecules are the same. So molecules, like other molecules, are want to hang out with each other. Uh, other molecules dislike them. Other molecules just don't care. All depends on the type of molecules, okay? I was thinking it was a question. But this is the same thing that we was talking. I just read what is explaining the same way. All right, so let's go into the cell membrane. Okay, this is very simple. But this is the continuation of the previous statement that we was talking. So we are going to link what is the consideration between each other to make us understand how is going to be the cell membrane made. And you know why we need to know that this is no biology, this is biology of oh, high school. No, you need to you need to remember that because there is some substances, some hormones, or some uh, uh, vitamins or minerals that they can pass easily or difficult through the cell membrane because you need to understand how they are going to attract fat, how they are going to attract water. So, and for that, we need to talk about the cell membrane. For example, the vitamin A, D, E, and K, they can pass easily the cell membrane, but the vitamin A and the vitamin, uh, sorry, the vitamin C, the vitamin C, and some vitamin B cannot pass the cell membrane for a reason. What reasons are those? For the bonds. We are going to talk about covalent and uh, no polar and polar 
uh, uh, molecules and that is going to help or to make it easy or difficult to pass to the cell membrane. All right, so that is basically what I want to go. Now, let's talk about the cell membrane. The cell membrane is going to be a form by a bilayer, bilayer, bilayer of molecules. So what is strange, right? They are going to organize in two layers. So if you see here, this is the cell membrane. The cell membrane, one layer is all this. This is one layer. And the second layer is the this one here. These layers are going to be the double layer membrane or bilayer uh, bi uh, membrane. So we call bilayer membrane, okay? Or double layer membrane, double layer membrane of the cell membrane. Okay, it's the same. All right, perfect. So now, if you see here, each layer is composed, each layer, this, for example, let's talk about this layer. This layer is composed by different molecules. Listen to this. One, I'm going to draw one molecule first. One molecule will be this. And these tails. So we have like a head and tail. This is one molecule. This is another molecule. This is another molecule. And another molecule. And another molecule. And another molecule. And another molecule. Same here. It's strange, right? Upside down. So we have here another molecule here, another molecule here, another molecule, another molecule. So the molecule is composed by this. This is a molecule. So now, what are these components of these molecules? So you know, Atoms are going to come together to form molecules. And molecules, they can come together as well to create a, a, bigger, a bigger molecule. So for this, we have this head. It's called the head. And these are the tails in plural. We have two tails, right? You see two tails. One tail and one tail. So this head is formed by phosphorus. Phosphorus. Phosphorus, called P, phosphorus. And the tails, each tail, this tail, you see here, just what I mark, is a fatty acid. Fatty acid, fat in other words. Fatty acid. How many of these fatty acids? We have one and two fatty acids. So in conclusion, each molecule is actually composed by one phosphorus and two fatty acids. That molecule is going to be called the phospho, phospho because phosphorus, lipids, phospholipids, okay, or phospholipid, phospholipid. Is phospholipids is, is one, two, or more molecules. Phospholipid is only one of these. The phosphorus and the two tails of fatty acids. You okay with that? You follow me? Be all right? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. So now, tell me one thing. Uh, when you, you do your salad, when you want to do your salad, your salad, basically, you can put uh, olive oil, that is oil, and you put some vinegar, right? Vinegar. Vinegar, that is one. Vinegar, we are going to make another experiment. Instead of vinegar, we are going to use water to make it more evident, okay? More evident. So you have water and you have oil. The oil can be mixed with water, yes or no? No. No. No, right? Why? Even though when you do your salad, so for example, vinegar and water have the same same uh, property, similar property. You don't drink water, you don't drink vinegar, vinegar for water, right? But they have the same, uh, I would say, chem chemical uh, properties or same chemical uh, charges, etc. Okay. So, for example, you you have your salad, you put your oil and you put the vinegar, and then you shake it out. 
the all move the oil with the with the vinegar and the vinegar if you don't eat the salad for a while the vinegar is going to get separate from the fat right so that's why you need to eat it right now on the uh, on the spot after you cook the salad same thing happened with the water the water you can put it with oil you shake it out and they are going to be basically a mix but after a while they separate each other because they don't like each other they don't like water cannot mix with water because the water and uh, they repel the the fat and the fat repel the water so i don't i don't like you so go away so that is what is doing the fat and water but tell me one thing can you mix water and water yes yeah and this equal more water and water they get separate after that the answer is no they are going to steal together right they don't separate now on the other hand you have oil this oil are going to when you mix for example olive oil or canola oil they get apart they oh, you have sesame oil truffle oil whatever oils you mix all oil, oil and oil and you wait like whatever you want to wait are they going to make they're going to separate each other yes or no 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 right so oil are going to mix permanently with oil so that means oil love oil and water love water but water do not like fat and fat do not like water okay you follow me all right so now we have here that the head phosphorus like water they like water so this is phosphorus are going to be called hydro hydro means water philic hydrophilic hydrophilic Hydro means water. Philic is a Latin word that said attraction, to one and to accept. Okay, hydro, hydrophilic. So water always going to look for a phosphorus that is an hydrophilic, always are going to look for water. Water, where are you? Okay, I want to go with you. I want to go with you. That is what is doing the phosphorus. Meantime, the tails that are the fatty acids they don't like the water they like fat so that is going to be called hydrophobic so phobic means when you are afraid or go away from something all right so is that clear so remember the water and the and the and the fat that is playing the fat is hydrophobic so they repel they want to go away from the water and hydrophilic i love water water hydrophilic all right who is the who is the hydrophilic portion of the cell membrane is going to be the, the head of the phospholipid this molecule is called phospholipid phosphorus and lipid so this portion are going to be hydrophilic all these heads are going to be hydrophilic. And this head, again, is going to be hydrophilic. And these tails are going to be hydrophobic, away from the water. You agree with that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now, why is coming upside down to each other? Why they are going to be, uh, why they are going to be this configuration? Very simple. That this configuration is going, you have a cell membrane here. This is a cell membrane, the cell membrane with the nucleus, etc. And this take a piece of this cell membrane. This is what is representing here, all this. Okay? All right. So for this, what I want you to remember is that whatever mostly what we have outside, outside the cell is a lot of concentration of water. And the inside the cell are going to be a lot of concentration of water as well. 
a lot of water as well. So we have a lot of water. This is out. This is in, in this, uh, in this cartoon. And you have a lot of water in, out, sorry, out. A lot of water. And a lot of water inside as well. Now you can tell. So this water, these phospholipids, the heads are phosphorus, are going to get, trying to get closer to the water. So they go in this direction. But meantime, the fatty acids that are hydrophobic, they hate water, they are trying to hide behind the phosphorus. So that's why they get this configuration. And on the other hand here, we have the inner layer is a bilayer membrane or cell membrane. The inside the cells have a lot of water as well. So the redirection of the molecule are going to be the phosphorus towards the water. I look, I want to go water, water. And they are going to hide behind the phosphorus, the lipids. So that is how they are going to be formed the bilayer, bilayer membrane of the cell membrane. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So now, as a conclusion, as a conclusion, I, I can erase this. Uh, polar is going to be the water. Okay, so listen to this. Polar are going to be hydrophilic. This ionic is hydrophilic as well. And this fat is going to be hydrophobic. I will put here O because it's fat. Phobic. Hydrophobic. Hydrophilic. Very thin. Oh, no, what am I talking about? The polar is water. Okay? All right. All right. So just in order to be okay with this part of the class, you need to put in your mind. You need to close your eyes and think about the chart. Bones. Okay. Ionic and covalent. Covalent, polar, not polar. Now, bones, ionic, base example, sodium chloride. Hydrophilic. We have uh, covalent, covalent polar, water, hydrophilic. Covalent, no polar, fat, hydrophobic. If you you can do that 10 times in your mind, you have the concept complete. Okay? You okay with that? Yep. Yeah. Yes. All right. So I think it's, it's time for, let's make a lunch break. And uh, you have here the exercises and let's go to the chemistry of life that is going to be talking about the carbohydrates and the lipids today. Next time we will talk about proteins. All right, so I will give you until 12.32. Uh, Any questions so far? No. No. The class is clear. Yeah. Probably yeah. it's going to be a refresher from all previous previous courses in the past. Okay, so um, I promise I'm not going to talk about this anymore because we are going to apply more and more stuff. We have a lot. All right, I will see you then at 12.33. Thank you so much. All right, thank you.
Hello. All right, so let's continue with the class. <clears throat> Erin? The good news is that we are not going to talk about, uh, I mean, atoms and covalent, well, we are not going to talk covalent, yes, but uh, not about uh, orbits and all that. So that is past. All right, so let's continue with our lecture. Miss Erin, please, don't miss it. All right, so let's talk about the chemistry of life. It's the second point. So here, just to remind you about my mind mapping, the mind mapping is telling about this is a fade already. So we already talked about that. The yellow, always what is coming. And the white, what is what we are in, in yellow is what is we are going to talk right now, and in white is what is coming later. All right, so let's talk about the chemistry of life. So uh, first of all, we need to talk about biochemistry. Okay, biochemistry is this is very simple. Huh? Is the reaction that occur in your body? Yes. These all chemical reactions that happen in your body are going to be uh, happening in the, uh, those chemical reactions that happen inside your body. So what is a chemical reaction? A chemical reaction will be, for example, a substance A plus substance B that is going to produce a substance C. So A, one substance, B, another substance, and the product of this reaction are going to be called, that is going to call C. All right, so these chemical reactions, chemical reactions, react, chemical reaction means the combination. They're going to share electrons, they're going to get rid of some atoms, and the result of this product is going to be a chemical reaction. Remember, any chemical reaction that happens in your body is studied by the biochemistry, bio life. Chemistry is chemistry, the chemistry of life, biochemistry, okay? All right, so now, uh, tell me one thing. Uh, when you have a chemical reaction, uh, all these chemical reactions, A plus B, are going to have a helper. It's going to have a helper. This helper, what is going to do is to accelerate the chemical reaction. Somebody tell me what we are talking about right now. Somebody have an idea what we are talking about? Okay, so we have A plus B are going to react, but these reactions are going to be by, uh, uh, helped by one another substance. What is this substance? This substance is called an enzyme enzyme you heard about enzymes before right all right so these enzymes are going to accelerate the chemical reaction you want proof of that i will give you a proof of that tell me one thing when you are weak you are low on sugar when you have low on sugar you take sugar right so to boost your energy how long do you need to wait for that you start to feel the boost, right? Few moments, right? Few moments, in seconds, even few, few, few moments, very few moments, you start to have this boost of energy, correct? And why is that? Because chemical reactions are going to happen very fast. And why they're happening very fast are going to be because of these enzymes, enzymes, enzymes. Write down this, please. Enzyme is a protein. Enzymes are equal to, say, proteins. It's a type of protein that are going to accelerate the chemical reaction. All right, so you're running your car. You're running your car. Okay, let's suppose that you can push your car uh, uh, and you're running out of gas. You don't have gas anymore. So your car is stopped and you, for, you can push your car. Let's put it that you can push your car. 
So you're pushing the car to the next gas station. The gas station is like uh, one block from you. So you're going to push the car. Now, this pushing your car yourself is going to take a longer time. What about if somebody have compassion of you and come to you and help you to push the car? If they push the car, both of you are going to reach faster the gas station. Yes or no? Okay. So the chemical reaction, the chemical reaction will be basically the representation of the car, the car. And actually the helper is going to be the enzyme. So all chemical reactions are going to need an enzyme to accelerate the chemical reaction or result. We okay with that? Enzymes are always a protein. Okay, so now, if you, if you eat, uh, for example, something, some sugar, because you are weak of energy, you don't need to wait, you don't, you don't need to wait until tomorrow to feel better, right? You feel faster in a few moments. You're going to start having the boost of energy. Why? Because the enzymes are going to accelerate that chemical reaction. Okay, one more time. Enzymes are proteins. Now, listen to this. When you have A, substance A, reacting with substance B, the enzymes are going to be coming to cooperate. But this enzyme, when you the chemical reaction is, is done, is finished, the enzyme will not be part of the result. So they are going to go away. It's like when somebody is pushing your car, your car, your car is the chemical reaction. You are, uh, you are uh, the chemical reaction, and then the helper is coming. And when you reach the gas station, the helper is gone. It's not going to be with you. It's going to thank you so much, goodbye, see you. Hopefully, not to see you next time, right? So that is basically what is doing the enzyme. The, in conclusion, the enzyme will not be part of the resultant of the chemical reaction. Okay? It's coming, helping, and leaving. We all right? Okay, perfect. So now, tell me one thing. The car, when you ignite your car, when you have the ignition of your car, your car is going to have a chemical reaction. The chemical reaction is to basically comb make combustion with the gas, with the gasoline, correct? Okay, so now, let's, that is a chemical reaction that happens through the, the car to, to have the power to move. After a few minutes, you stop the car and you touch the engine with your hand. You feel some heat, correct? It's warm. So that means that the whole jet energy that is being provided by gas the, is going to be used for to move the car. But some of this energy is going to be dissipating. And that is going to dissipate in the form of heat, warm. Now, I want you to touch your hand. And when you touch your hand, tell me, your hand is cold as a stone? No, right? Your body is warm or is cold? Cold like uh, ice. Warm, warm, right? No, warm. Where do you think is coming that heat? Chemical no, reactions. Not cold, uh, chemical reactions. There you are. Chemical reactions are going to be like a gas and the car. The car is going to be part of that energy to move the car, and the other part will be dissipated as heat. Okay? So the temperature of your body is telling you that you have chemical reactions. A dead body is warm or cold? Cold, right? A dead body. After a while, it's going to be cold. So that means there is no chemical reactions. There is no heat to be released from those chemical reactions. You okay with that? No. Yep. Uh, let's see. Marcel, Marcel, yeah. uh, Daniel, all of you, tell me, do you realize how many chemical reactions we have in our body? We have for each cell, for every single, 
uh, this uh, uh, airing, what happened with your camera? You in and out. What happened with your camera, Aaron? Are you, you're in and out all the time. So are you okay? Uh, yeah, my connection just, it keeps like turning off and then it goes okay. back on. Okay, mister. All right, so how many chemical reactions we have? First of all, I want to tell you, we have 1,500 different enzymes in every single cell. Average, we have 1,500 enzymes in every different cell. I didn't say 1,500 enzymes. I said 1,500 different enzymes in our in every single cell. And you know that that we have, listen to this number, I'm not going to ask that, but that is just to give you an idea where is coming the heat of your body. We have 1,000 trillion, 1,000 trillion, 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 it's a lot, trillion. It's three times more than the United States in all these years. So 1,000 trillion chemical reactions in one, only in one second. Only in just in one second, you have 100 trillion chemical reactions for every second. So imagine one second, two seconds, one, one hour, one day, all your life, right? Chemical reactions. So that is where it's coming from. That is where it's coming from your heat. Okay. Now, I want to tell you one more thing. The chemical reactions, they need a place to happen. The chemical reactions, they need a place. They need a medium. We already talked about the medium. A medium will be, for example, what we call the water. Water. Water is needed in order to have chemical reactions. Example, if you are dehydrated, if you are dehydrated, you have less water in your body. Your, your body starts to tend to be cold when you are dehydrated. And that is because there is no enough medium, means water, to happen those chemical reactions. That's why, that's why we need water. So now you need to remember that. We need water in order to give the medium for all chemical reactions to happen. So when you are dehydrated, those chemical reactions are not going to have happen in full. So you start to have low levels of temperature. Interesting, right? Okay, so let's keep moving. So it's important to be a person that is hydrated very well. So one of the things that you as a nurse, you need to identify if the patient is dehydrated. Having a proper and a, 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 according up a heat hydration of the patient, that is going to facilitate the chemical reactions to happen. So dehydration is a very bad thing. Okay, all right, so let's keep moving. So what is biochemistry? Is the study of the uh, chemical reactions in your body. All right, so we are going to differentiate now between what is organic versus inorganic molecules. Inorganic molecules and organic molecules. Some inorganic molecules can be in uh, actually in our body too, but organic as well, right? What is unorganic and what is, I'm going back and forth, is organic versus inorganic molecules. Organic molecules, organic molecules, listen to this, the definition is there. Molecules that have one molecule, molecules composed by, uh, by two at least atoms, right? Molecules that have at least one carbon, 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 and uh, carbon, in the, doesn't matter in the center, whatever. One carbon surrounded or with one hydrogen. So the, the, the precise thing is this. A molecule who contain at least one carbon and one hydrogen, that is an organic molecule. You okay with that? All right, so that is important open eyes, open ears, I'm telling you. Then inorganic are going to be everything else. Okay, a, a, quick, a, a, a quick answer from you guys. 
Tell me, water is organic or inorganic? Inorganic. Inorganic, see? There is many students making me say, oh, water, oh, water is important. Okay, organic. No, 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 no. The definition of organic is that you need to have at least one carbon and one, one carbon and one hydrogen. In this case, you, you have the hydrogen, but you don't have the carbon. So that water becomes an inorganic uh, molecule. Now you excel, you excel, you excel air. When you excel air, you are actually eliminating carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide is organic or inorganic? Organic. Inorganic. Inorganic. Inorganic, right? Carbon dioxide is inorganic. Why? Because they have one carbon, but they don't have the hydrogen. So that is what is turned the carbon dioxide into inorganic molecule. So you need to have, again, what is organic? Organic is when you have at least one carbon plus, plus, plus one, one hydrogen. Is that clear or not? Okay. All right, so alcohol, for example, alcohol from now on, you're going to write it down like this. Ethyl alcohol, okay, ethylic acid. Ethyl, ethylic acid, ethyl, 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 or whatever, ethyl. That is when you, when we are going in nursing, in medicine, when we said alcohol, we don't write down alcohol. Ethyl, ethyl, it's fast, okay? So alcohol, they have one carbon here, and we have one hydrogen here, or any hydrogen. So at least they have one hydrogen, at least one hydrogen, at least one carbon, that is organic, okay? Carboxylic acid, the acetic acid, this is the vinegar, are going to be carbon here, we have hydrogen here, or hydrogen here. So at least they have one carbon, one acid organic. Aldehyde, that is basically the, one, the sprays that make it smell, lavender, all that, those are aldehyde. Um, we in the body produce all day too because of the metabolism of fats and sometimes of proteins. We will see that. We have carbon and hydrogen. So if you see here ether, that is an aesthetic, or uh, ether is an aesthetic, uh, uh, I mean, inhale, that is going to be one carbon and hydrogen. Ester, ketones, amines, amine, uh, uh, amide. Uh, uh, do I going to ask all this? No, I'm not going to ask that, of course. The concept here for these two slides is to know what is the difference between organic and inorganic. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Number two, six most common elements in biochemistry. The six most common elements in biochemistry. So I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you that these elements are going to be always organic. No, it can be inorganic sometimes. What I just read in here is six most common elements or minerals in biochemistry. So these are the most common elements that you have in your body. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, phosphorus, phosphate. So how to remember that? Very simple. Just say chance P, chance P, chance P. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six most common elements in biochemistry. Carbon, carbon, for example, carbon. I will, I will see this something. Carbon, carbon. Tell me one thing. Uh, the, the meat, the meat, let's do barbecue, barbecue. This barbecue is going to, let's put some meat there, some T-bone or whatever, uh, angus, whatever you want, all right? So uh, tell me, this having a lot of, of, this is organic, correct? All right, so they have carbon and hydrogens in their, in their molecules. Tell me one thing, when you burn the meat, what color is that? Black. Black, right? Dark black, correct? And what is basically that dark black? What is the content of that? 
The carbon. Excellent. Charcoal. Yeah, that is a charcoal. Charcoal or coal or carbon. That is why it's black. Carbon is black. Okay? So when you burn a log, for example, bonfire, you, it becomes black. So what is remaining it? That is the a charcoal. It's a coal. C-O-A-L. Carbon. Hydrogen basically are going to be in the water. Oxygen, why do we need oxygen? Okay, so listen to this, please. Why do you need to breathe? Why do you need oxygen? The air, by the way, the air is not composed on, is not composed only by oxygen. It's going to compose by other elements, other substances. Okay? So, for example, helium, we have uh, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, we have oxygen, that is air. Air is not the same to say oxygen. Oxygen is part of the air, the air. Okay? Okay. So now, this oxygen is needed for what? Tell me one thing. Let's talk about chemical reactions, right? Tell me one thing. When you, when you ignite your car to turn on the car with gas, tell me. This can turn on without oxygen in the environment? No. No, right? How, how we can prove that? Homework. Put your car inside the lake and try to turn on the car in, under the water. Can you? Why not? No, no don't, don't do that. Huh? No, no, there's no, no oxygen. oxygen. There is no oxygen. So... Let's try to interpolate that with the body. With your body, your body, all these 1,000 trillion chemical reactions per second, that is a brutally number, my God. It's, I cannot imagine that number. It's incredible, amazing. So all of these reactions, I would say 99% of the chemical reactions are going to need oxygen. So why do we need oxygen? We need oxygen for chemical reactions. And why do we need chemical reactions? To accomplish all the functions. One of them to produce energy, the ATPs. So why do we need water? Why do we need water? We need water, we need water to make, give the medium for chemical reactions happen. We need oxygen, why do we need to breathe? We need to breathe. Well, that's why we need to drink water, right? Why do you need to breathe? Because you provide oxygen for those chemical reactions that they need oxygen. 99% of chemical reactions in the body need oxygen. The car under the lake. Okay? Why do we need to eat? Why do we need to eat? We need to eat because that is going to provide the energy to produce ATPs. Why, what do we use for energy? We use the ATPs. But in order to produce ATPs, you need to eat because that is the source of energy to produce the ATPs. So we don't use directly the energy from the food. That energy given by the food is actually is, is taken to produce ATPs. You okay with that? So now, you know why you need to eat, why you need to drink, why you need to breathe. All right? All right, so let's keep moving. The nitrogen. Nitrogen. Nitrogen, please uh, write down this, is the only one, the only component in the body who have nitrogen are the proteins. Proteins contain nitrogen. Proteins contain, 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 contain nitrogen. 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 Do you smell nitro nitrogen in the past? Somebody smell nitrogen? No? I, I guess yes. I, I will say yes. Now. Where is the nitrogen? Very good, Aaron. It's in the hair, right? Your hair. Excellent. Yeah. The hair, the hair is a protein. And the hair is contained a lot of nitrogen. 
a lot of nitrogen. Your hair is a protein, huh? it's called keratin, another type. But the, the hair is a protein. Tell, tell me, did you burn your hair someday in the past? No? Thanks God, I did. You know, I opened an oven and fire came out. Thanks God, I was with glasses, but my eyelashes, eyelashes, eyebrows, gone. Half of my hair here, I, well, almost there because I don't have hair as before, that are actually gone. So I was no hair in my face. When somebody burned the hair, do you feel that smell? The smell of, of bur yes. burned hair? Yes. That is the nitrogen that is being burned and evaporated as gas. Nice? So you already have exposed to nitrogen. That is the nitrogen. Don't do a homework, okay? No, do, don't do it at home. Okay. Let's get moving. Sulfur. S is the sulfur. Just a moment. Just a moment, please. Give me a second. Okay. Sulfur. Where is the sulfur? The sulfur, you know, is we have sulfur where? In our DNA. DNA. The DNA is going to be having a lot of bonds of sulfur. So basically it's like a glue here. Sulfur is going to glue it some uh, some components of the of the DNA. So DNA we have sulfur. Just to what is coming later, I will tell you. If uh, if for some magic magic procedure, you take one cell and you go to the nucleus and you pull like a nylon, like a thread, the DNA, and if you want to stretch out the DNA, that DNA is going to measure six feet long. Can you imagine that? Six feet long, only one DNA in one cell. And we have 100 trillion cells in our body. Huge, right? It's, it's amazing. And that is all these DNA containing sulfur in their bonds. Phosphorus, the P, the next one. Phosphorus is part of the ATPs, ATPs. Phosphorus is actually in the ATPs. What is ATP? ATP is the adenosine, and I start to write down. You sooner or later you need to know this. Triphosphate. Yes. So that is the energy that you use. Adenosine A T as a tri. tri we have three, three what? Three phosphates, three phosphorus. So that is the ATP. ATP, one phosphorus, one phosphorus, and another phosphorus. So it's going to be ATP, okay. three phosphate. Okay? All right, so we are... The G. We, we, when is, yes. What does A stand for? ATP, S? triphosphate. What does A stand for? You mean S, the S? ATP, right? You you said uh, uh, ATP, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And what you're asking? ADP. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to be a little bit ahead, but I will tell you now. You're asking and answer. ADP is the yes. adenosine. And probably it's, it's good to ask that. Is di phosphate. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Listen to this. I'm going to take advantage of this moment. Look at that. We have the ADP. ADP. Two phosphates, correct? ADP. Now, I need to add this is an uncharged battery. The ATP, the ATP is a charged battery. 
charge. And this ADP is an uncharged battery. Okay? Now, in order to obtain, to turn, turn to the uncharged to a charged battery to be used ready for energy, you need to add one phosphorus. Yes or no? Add. Yes or no? You follow me? Yes. Now, yeah. in order to bring, thank you, in order to bring this phosphorus and glue it to the ADP, you need energy. It's not for free. It's coming for energy. You need to put something, a block on the wall, a brick, just to make a build, uh, a wall, in order to grab the, the brick to put it in place and glue it. They need energy. It's not for just by, uh, uh, by just wishing, right? So you need to use energy. That energy that is used to bring the phosphate to the ADP are going to be coming from the food. From what part of the food? The bones of the food. You break the bones of the food that release energy. Released energy is not going to be destroyed. It's going to be transformed. That energy coming from the breaking bones of the nutrients are going to release the energy and that energy is going to take one phosphorus to put it into the ADP. And then at the end, what you're going to have is the ATP. And that is ready to use for the body for energy. Be okay with that? Nice, right? It's not nice? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's go to the next uh, uh, lesson. Now, uh, all right, so we already talked about that. Now re we are going to talk about the some, uh, let me see what is coming. Yeah, body cavities. What time is it, please? Oh, God, I need to finish this right now. 105. 105, yeah. All right, so for this, I want, yes, you already, this is open eyes, Sean P, okay? So <clears throat> we are going to talk about monomers and polymers. And then we are going to touch again uh, metabolism and we finish that part to do to the very important part, the body cavities. Okay. All right, so I'm going to make it a simple and a summary of what we have here. Okay, so we have monomers. Monomers. And we have poly Mers, polymers. Mono means one. Poly means many. All right, so I want just to realize something, guys. Look at that. Tell me, when you eat a piece of bread, what do you eat in the bread? Egg, chicken, I don't know, whatever you like in your bread. Tell me, if you eat a piece of chicken, that chicken is going to travel exactly as it is into your bloodstream? No, right? You don't, you, you don't have in your blood running broccoli or, or, or actually chicken or pork or nothing like that, right? So in order, how, but how these nutrients from the food are going to be useful, use for the body. Now, that's why you need to eat it. How, what does it mean? You need to chew it. Why you need to chew it? You need to chew food to make the molecules and to make the pieces of the meat smaller. Smaller and smaller. Smaller and smaller. Then they go to the stomach. In the stomach are going to have acid. And that acid, if you put a piece of meat in acid, that is going to break it down the meat in a small and a small and a small and a small component. Then they go to the intestine. In the intestine, there are going to be other, other uh, chemical reactions that are going to make it even smaller, smaller and smaller. So the big piece of chicken or meat that you have put it in your mouth at the very beginning, in the intestines are going to be at the level of molecules. And these molecules are, are small enough to pass through the cells of the intestines. 
So in the lumen, lumen is the space of the intestine. Okay, I'm going to write lumen very soon. The space of the intestine, the food is there and they need to be absorbed. When they are absorbed, they are tiny enough in order to pass the cell membrane. Remember we saw the cell membrane before? They need to pass to, to that cell membrane. And for that, they need to be tiny enough to be absorbed. This tiny, uh, they are going to be absorbed, then are going to pass into the blood stream. And that is how the nutrients are going to pass the piece of chicken, the piece of meat, whatever you eat, are going to pass into the bloodstream. Otherwise, will not be able to pass. These smallest units are going to be called the monomers. So monomers of what? We have three main macronutrients. I, I will not mention macronutrients yet, but I'm going to mention the nutrients. Nutrients. The nutrients are going to come from the carbohydrates, sugars, and they're going to come from the fat, and they're coming from the proteins. Carbohydrates are going to have a big molecule like this. Whatever is the formula. Fats are going to be big chains of, car of carbons like this, with each attached with hydrogens. There's a lot of hydrogens here, hydrogens, hydrogens, hydrogens. Proteins are going to be this type of molecule. So these are molecules. All right. So these carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, they have polymers and they can have monomers. All of the carbohydrate monomer, fat monomers, and protein monomers. We have carbohydrates like the glucose, for example, you need to get used to glucose, lactose, uh, etc. galactose, uh, we have maltose, sucrose, etc. So just mention few one. One, so far one is the glucose. So these, uh, glucose are okay so this glucose this glucose are going to be uh, actually able to be absorbed all right so i will tell you a few things here all right so let's go to the point because time is short and i want to have plenty of time to talk about the body parts because this main part of the exam all right so monomers in the in carbohydrates carbohydrates are going to be the glucose are going to be the uh, uh, galactose and it's going to be the uh, the fructose polymers are going to be for example, the cellulose, the glycogen. I'm not going to touch about amylase, amylopectin, so it's coming later. So these, mol these monomers are tiny enough. These molecules are big, too big to pass through the cell membrane. So monomers are the smallest unit of actually of the nutrient that can be absorbed by the by the intestine. That is carbohydrates. The fat. Fat, we have polysaturate. We have, for example, omega-3. Something to give you something that you're familiar with. Omega-3. But the monomer is the fatty acid. Yes, the fatty acid. Fatty acid is the monomer. Fatty acids are like this. So only one. So it's like a, a small worm. We have fatty acids. Fatty acids are these molecules like this. Well, it's going to be C C C C C C H H H H, right? So fatty acid. Then Dr. we have G, yes. Yes. sharing the screen. We can't see anything you're drawing or anything. Right now? Really? Yeah. Why didn't 
Okay, so please uh, tell me when that happened, please, okay? So I've been talking like already 20 minutes, I guess. So please tell me, always the screen, uh, the screen should be shared, okay? So it's my fault. So please remind me, help me with that, okay? Okay? Okay. okay. Wow, I've, I've, I didn't, okay. So, but ATP and the ADP are clear or no? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's continue here. We, then we have this is the monomer. Monomer is a single molecule. It's a single molecule. And polymers are actually many molecules together. Many molecules. So because of the size of many molecules, they cannot pass the cell membrane. The cell membrane need to pass. This is the cell membrane. This is the cell membrane, and the cell membrane are going to. They, you need to. This can pass. Yes, this cannot pass. Cannot pass because they are too big. Molecules are going to be like this huge. Okay, all right. So I'm telling now the monomers, the glucose, galactose, fructose, the fatty acids are going. Fat are going to be fatty acids. So I put this, this like snails or like uh, something because they have a chain like this. It's carbon, 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 hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. Just to make it simple, I draw it like this, okay? All right, so the proteins. The proteins are, the, the monomers are going to be the amino acids. Amino acids. Amino acids. A, a polymer is is a protein okay so how we can uh, we can think about this you have a wall you are a builder and you want to build a wall with bricks the whole wall is uh, mr verda is calling me sorry it's the coordinator i cannot say more just a moment please
Okay, sorry for that again. Okay, so let's finish. Is uh, some people come a roll late and I need to, okay. All right, so now here we have the proteins. The proteins, as I said, are going to be the amino acids at the monomer. Amino acid. Amino acids. Amino acids are going to be proteins. So I was telling you, if you're going to build up a wall with bricks, the whole wall is called a protein. The whole wall is going to be called protein. Each brick is going to be the amino acid. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. So a protein is going to have hundreds, even two thousand, uh, group of amino acids. They're going to be repeat amino acids, different amino acids, any combination that you want about from 20 amino acids. You have 20 pieces, you can actually, uh, different pieces, you can have one of one, one of them, 10 of them, 10 of one of, 10 of or each of them, or 20, or 10 and then 20 different. So any combination that you can imagine between amino acids, all these together are going to form a protein. Fatty acids. Fatty acids are going to be, for example, we have uh, fatty acids, the phospholipids are containing fatty acids, but the fatty acids together are going to form the triglycerides. Triglycerides. Or are going to form cholesterol. So those are polymers, okay? So fatty acids are going to be the the monomer for fat. Amino acids, the monomer for proteins. And we have these molecules, monomers called carbohydrates, that I want you to remember is that glucose. Glucose is a monomer. Be okay with that? Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right, so monomer. Monomer, one or a measure of unit. So a molecule that can be bonded to other identical molecules to form a polymer. Dimer, trimer, so dimer, two molecules, trimer, three, tetramer, four, polymer, many more. Oligo, some of them. So, but monomer, the concept is only one molecule. Polymer, many, as we already mentioned. I already mentioned. Okay, so just to finish this part, we are going to talk about the metabolism, metabolism again. Metabolism is our chemical reactions. Biochemistry, don't get confused. Biochemistry is the study of these chemical reactions. So biochemistry is the study of the metabolism. Metabolism is part of the biochemistry. Is that clear? Okay. Metabolism in few words is how the body use energy how the body create and use energy. How the body create and use energy. You are doing more exercises, you need to create more energy. So you need, when you are doing exercises, you are more hungry, yes or no? Right? Why? Yes. Because it's, you need ATPs. In order to create ATPs, you need energy to put that phosphorus into the ATP. And where is coming from? From the food. When you are couch potato, two weeks vacation, Cancun, whatever you want, your metabolism is going down. Your metabolism is going down, and basically, uh, you don't need that much energy. So you don't need to eat that much food. If you are resting and you are eating, eating without doing exercises, you are going to use part of that energy. You are resting and you're eating a lot. What you're going to do is gain weight, right? Why? Because the body is going to is going to take the nutrients only for the energy that you use that day. Only for the energy that you use that day. So that means calories, kilocalories. If you eat more kilocalories than you require, those kilocalories are going to be stored as fat. Okay? So just a conclusion here. Metabolism, how your body uses energy. Another uh, definition of metabolism, same valid, equal, equally valid, 
is going to be the summation of reactions, anabolic and catabolic reactions. Anabolic, catabolic reaction. Okay, reaction. Catabolic, what means catabolic? Write down this, breaking or broken down the nutrients, broken down the nutrients. Catabolism, catabolism, breaking down the nutrients, the bones. What for? To release energy. That is where you obtain the energy. Okay? And anabolism means building up. Building up what? A protein. Building up a tissue. Building up or replace cells who are being damaged. Anabolism, building up. Your, the, your, the cell is your house. Somebody broke the window. You need to replace it. You need energy to replace that end, that window. And the building up and pull together a new window is anabolic. You need to eat for the energy, catabolism. And you need to replace the window for the energy to replace the window. The window itself is you building up your, or maintaining your house. You're changing the window. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. And the last thing, I will tell you something. Write down this. Babies, the youngest, the more anabolic reaction you have. The youngest, more anabolic you are. The youngest, more anabolic. The youngest, less catabolic. So when you're young, you are more anabolic building up than breaking down. When you are young, you are more anabolic and less catabolic. When you get old, it's the opposite. When you get old, write down that. When you get old, you are less anabolic and more catabolic. You get me that? Another example. Tell me, when you are sick, when you are sick, what happens when you are sick? When you are sick, your cells are being damaged. Correct? Some cells are being destroyed, yes or no? Whatever, inflammation, whatever, right? So you are sick, you have a disease, your cells are being damaged. When your cells are being damaged, what is going to do the body? The body needs to replace the tissue who was damaged, yes or no? In order to replace, to replace these cells who were damaged, you need energy, yes or no? Yes. yes. Where, where is coming that energy? from catabolic reactions. They provide, catabolic provide the energy to make an anabolic reactions. Proof of that, you want the proof of that? Homework, no, no, don't do this homework, okay? Get sick for one week. So whatever sick, somebody who is sick for one week. You were sick more than one week, once in the past? Tell me, do you lose or you gain weight? You lose weight. You lose weight, right? Yes or no? Why are you losing yeah. weight? Because your tissue will need to be repaired and you need energy. So the body is using all the resources of nutrients that are stored in your body. Fat, carbohydrates, especially. And they are going to be breaking down, breaking down to release ATP to replace the tissue who were damaged. That's why you lose weight when you are sick. So conclusion here, write down this. Patient who, with the disease, any disease, the patient is more catabolic than anabolic. So Marcel, what do you want to do if the patient is sick? How you can take care of the patient? You need to give it special food, easy to be absorbed, easy food. You don't give taco with jalapeno or something like that, right? You give some chicken soup with nice noodles, soft, whatever, easy to absorb, to make the absorption faster because the body needs more energy. They're going to break down the nutrients. We okay with that? Okay, excellent. So, uh, all right, so let's get started with the last part of the lecture. All right, so here we have, for example, uh, monomers, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids. I want you to remember the, uh, uh, 
the glucose, the amino acids, the lipid, fatty acids are the monomers. Polymers, we see the triglycerides, I mentioned uh, omega-3. Proteins are proteins. Polypeptides, there is a slightly different. I'm not going to get confused on that. You confused on that. But polypeptides are more chains of amino acids. Proteins is the complete chain, in other words. But just remember protein. In carbohydrates, we have, see, cellulose, cellulose, uh, this amylose, amylopectin, I don't want you to get dizzy with that. So I want just to remember the other one is that glycogen. 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 I want to start you, get used to these names. Glycogen. 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 Glycogen is a polymer of a carbohydrate. Now, one last thing I want just to, uh, this is coming open eyes, open ears, uh, open ears, open ears, is the uh, nucleic acids. The nucleic acids are going to be pieces of the DNA. Pieces of DNA. So those are called the nucleotides. Nucleotides. If you compare a, a spiral stairs, a spiral stairs, you have the spiral stairs, go to the spiral stairs. The spiral stairs go having like a thousand story story building. So that is the DNA. The steps where you are putting your foot in those spiral steps, stairs, each step is going to be called a nucleotide or called base. This is the monomer of the DNA. Okay, and if you put all the steps of the spiral stairs all together, you're going to form the DNA. Is that clear or not? So the difficult you for you to because for the exam is to remember the word nucleotide. Nucleotide. Nucleotide are the pieces of the DNA. Nucleotide is called base as well. The base. The base. Just remember the step of the spiral stairs. You okay with that? In a few words, I make yeah. you just actually explain about the ba the monomer of the DNA. So DNA, you can compare like a spiral stairs with thousand story building. Okay, if the DNA, these bases are going to be like a normal proportion of our size in normal life, the DNA, those uh, six feet long in the cellular, in the cell, transforming proportion of human size is going to be 1,000 story building. And each base, each step, is going to be one base or called nucleotide. Each step, each base, each nucleotide is called a monomer of the of the DNA or RNA. That is, and the DNA, all the stairs, one to one thousand stories, that is the DNA. Pieces of the DNA is going to be the nucleotide. Pieces of the triglycerides are going to be the fatty acid. Pieces of the proteins are going to be the amino acids. Pieces of glucose are going to, of the glycogen polymer, are going to be the glucose. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So let's go here and let's go to introduction of body organs. Okay, I'm behind three minutes. All right, so we are ready. Can we start? Yep. Okay. So here we have the body cavity. We are going to talk about body cavities. We are going to talk about some definitions. This area is going to take me a lot of time to talk. And I think with that, we finish. Look like it's short, but I'm going to explain a lot. All right. So probably this is uh, remind you your high school time. So that, but we are going to add more stuff. Okay. All right. So we have dorsal. You know what is dorsal towards the spine. It's a question for the exam today. And ventral towards the belly, right? Ventral is, an, is towards the belly. My God, my camera is not on. Okay. So body cavities. So we have the uh, dorsal. What is dorsal? To the spine. Look at this. This is the dorsal space. We have all this space, and between the verte vertebra are going to be in a space what is running the spinal cord. This is the spinal cord. So all what I draw in red is a cavity. It's like a tunnel. It's like a tunnel. And this and this is a cavity. So all this is one cavity. 
All this, all what I draw in red, that is the dorsal cavity. And what they are going to contain, the brain here, the brain, this is the brain, and here is going to contain the spinal cord. So this cavity, this dorsal, uh, dorsal cavity are going to divide to, into cranial cavity and vertebral cavity or vertebral canal. So the vertebral canal and the cranial, cranial cavity. So those are the two components of the dorsal cavity. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I hope it's that clear because it's coming for the exam. Now, this area, we have the thoracic cavity. Thoracic cavity. Thoracic, we have all this area anterior to the body, all this area anterior to the body is going to be called the ventral cavity. Ventral cavity. This ventral cavity are going to divide in thoracic cavity, the thorax here, and the abdominal pelvic cavity. This is the abdominal pelvic cavity. So we have two components, abdominal Pelvic, don't forget that. Pelvic. Pelvic is part of the ventral cavity. And there is actually a one cavity here. So that's why it's called abdominal pelvic cavity, because there is no division between the pelvis and the abdomen. And at the difference between the thorax and the abdominal pelvic, this thorax is here, here we have a diaphragm in between. Can you see the diaphragm? The diaphragm is here. Diaphragm. This diaphragm is dividing the ventral cavity into thoracic cavity and abdominal pelvic cavity. And it's called abdominal pelvic cavity because we don't have a diaphragm here. We don't have a diaphragm like this. So it's a continuity, there is a continuity of the cavity between the abdomen and the pelvis. You okay with that? Yes. Okay, I'm going to give you, I'm tempted to tell you some anklets here. All right, are you ready? Now, where is ending the pelvis? Where is ending the abdominal cavity? And where is begin the beginning of the of the pelvis? Okay, so yeah. it's very difficult to say that uh, because the anatomy is slightly variable. But what I'm going to tell you that is going and never forget this, please. Okay, all right especially when they are related to pain. So that's why we need to know about these body cavities. Why? Because you're going to assess the patient and you need to determine where is the pain of the patient. That's what we are going to end this, this class. So you need to know where is going to be the pain, in the abdomen or in the pelvis, right? And there is a st and it's still a little bit confusing sometimes. So just remember this. Any pain, any whatever pain, that is below the navel, below the navel, the pain can come from the pelvis. Can come. Not 100%, but 80 to 90% of the cases when the pain is below the navel are going to be uterus, ovarian, or fallopian tubes in fever, right? So lower abdominal pain. See, can you see, see this? Lower abdominal pain, I said. So that is still the abdomen in this division. But for pain, you need to consider that any pain below the navel, you need to think about uh, an pelvic organ. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. So now, excellent. So here we have the thorax. The thorax are going to be a frame. We have here the, uh, we have the clavicle. We have the vertebras here. We have the uh, rib cage, the, uh, the, the ribs, and here we have the diaphragm. So all this is the thoracic cavity. Thoracic cavity is divided in uh, other components. It's called the mediastinum. Mediastinum. We have anterior mediastinum. We have posterior mediastinum. We have middle mediastinum. And we have superior mediastinum. So what I want, do you want, uh, I, anterior mediastinum, we have the retrosternal fat. The posterior mediastinum, we have the IBC, the aorta, lymphatic. Superior, we have the arch of the, of the aorta and, uh, and brachiocephalic veins. 
and in the middle we have the heart. So what is the concept I want you to remember for the exam and for the future? The thorax is having divisions. These divisions are called the medias time. Medias time. You want to forget superior, anterior, forget, forget that, that's fine. So just remember they have many, many compartments, compartments called medias time. The one I want you to remember is the middle medias time. It's in the middle medias time where is located the heart. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. okay. All right, so now, uh, all right, so let me see. Okay. I always think to start this first than previous, but anyway, okay. All right, so we have the pericardial cavity, pleural cavity, pleural, pleural cavity, and we are going to add here the peritoneum. All right, so what is this? All right, so we have here, let me see if I can have a zoom here. Okay, so look at this. Here we are going to see some membranes. Okay, so membranes. This actually we have the, thor the thorax is going to contain the heart and the lungs. Two lungs, of course. Okay, all right. So now each portion of the, each, this is a space. In this space, we are going to have each lung. One lung here, one lung here, and in the center we have here the heart. And we have another peri another cavity here that is the peritoneal. You need to be familiar with that, peritoneal. Peritoneal cavity or abdominal cavity that composed to by the pelvis. Okay, anyhow. So this is the lung here inside. But the lung, if this is the lung, look, 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 into, look, look at this, this is a lung. And this is the other lung here. Okay, so the lungs are going to be covered by a membrane. This membrane are going to be surrounding the, the lung. There is one membrane here, and we have another layer here. Another layer. So this layer is not the lung; is is the wrap of the lung is the cover of the lung. So this membrane is called the pleural membrane. Pleural membrane. It's a double membrane. I didn't say double layer cell membrane. I said double layer. It's like you have one plastic bag, put one plastic bag open, of course. You open a plastic bag, you put another plastic bag open, you have a double plastic bag. Inside you put your hand, that is the lung. So that plastic is not your hand, right? So those plastics are the cover of the lungs. So this pleural membrane are going to have two layers. So we have similar here. And I'm going to make it more, so they are very close to each other, so, but for the purpose of explaining, I'm going to make it a little bit uh, uh, separate, okay? All right, so now this membrane, this membrane are going to, this membrane, are going to be closer to the lung. This membrane closer to the lung are going to be called the, the uh, visceral pleura. Visceral means organ. So what does that mean? This membrane is closer to the organ, is closer to the lung. And this other layer of the pleura, all these together is pleura, is called the parietal, parietal pleura. And what is parietal pleura? Parietal pleura is parietal means wall. So thorax is closer to the thoracic wall. So here we have the, the lung. We have one layer here that is close to the lung, the visceral layer, and we have another layer outer layer, that is the parietal layer, that is more in relation with the rib cage. You okay with that? 
So visceral is inner and parietal is more outer. Okay. Hello? Yes? Yep. Yeah, okay. So, but you say, why we need to know this? Okay, I will tell you why you need to know this. In between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, we have fluid. We have fluid. This fluid is about 30 ml. So that means that is about two tablespoons of, uh, of actually fluid. Why is doing this fluid? What is in between them? They are going to be there because the lung is going to inhale and exhale. It's going to change size all the time. They're going to a lot, a lot of motion, a lot of activity. So these membranes are going to decrease the friction between the lungs and the surrounding organs. That is the function of the pleural fluid. It's called pleural fluid. Pleural fluid. Make a recap here. We have the pleural membrane. Pleural membrane are going to be composed by the visceral layer, visceral, parietal layer. Visceral is the inner layer. Parietal is the outer layer of the pleural membrane. In between, we have the pleural fluid. I'm going to put it here, pleural fluid, pleural fluid. And what is the function? Is to decrease the friction of the organ with other tissues. You okay with that? Yep. Okay. So now, let's use, oh, I, I, I erased it I by mistake. Okay. All right, so that is the pleural membrane. The pleural membrane, what is going to form is the pleural cavity, the pleural cavity. So what is it, what is the composition of the pleural cavity? Cavity is that is composed by the pleural membrane. Pleural membrane, they have parietal and visceral, but a pleural fluid in between the two layers, in between the visceral and the parietal in between the two layers are going to be the fluid, decreasing the friction of the organ with the surrounding tissue. That is one. We have another one. We have the, the what? The peri, uh, peri, uh, pericardial, pericardial, pericardial space. The pericardial space I'm going to draw a heart here. This is a heart. Okay, make a heart like this. And I'm going to do similar here. This heart are going to have a pericardium. The pericardium. One layer here, and then I'm going to make a little bit to separate, and another layer here. So we have here, this is close to the wall, this parietal, the parietal layer, here we have the inner layer close to the heart is the visceral layer. Parietal layer plus visceral layer are uh, plus the pericardial fluid because they have fluids there, pericardial fluid, pericardial fluid, pericardial fluid, the pericardial fluid are going to be located here in between the two layers here. And the function you're already suspecting, what is the function? The function will be to decrease the friction because the heart is moving all the time. I'm going to decrease the friction between that, okay? So all this is called the pericardial space and the pericardial space is going to be composed by the pericardial membrane or pericardium, pericardium pericardium or pericardial membrane. All right, so that is the function of that. So we okay with that? Is that clear? Yep. Yes. Okay. The last one is the peritoneum. The peritoneum, the peritoneum is the same thing. Let's go having a, a box or a garbage can. A garbage can. Garbage can, I want you to open a, a bag, garbage bag, and put it inside, all the way down. 
and open, of course, right? And they put another garbage can, another, 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 one more garbage uh, bag. This bag, <coughs> garbage bag, you're going to have two layers again. So the can or the barge can are going to represent your abdomen. And the pericardium, are, I mean, the, the peritoneum, I'm going to put it here, peritoneum is going to be the double layer membrane, double layer membrane. So again, they have what? We have the parietal layer, close to the abdominal wall, the visceral layer, close to the internal organs. We have the peritoneal fluid, peritoneal fluid, that is about 30 ml as well. And that is actually what we are going to form, the peritoneum membrane or periton peritoneum or peritoneal membrane. It's the same. Okay? And that is going to produce the peritoneal cavity. Peritoneal cavity. So again, what is moving in the abdomen? What is moving in the abdo abdomen is all the GI tract. The small intestine, large intestine, gut bladder, all these are going to basically move. So that's why they are going to be, imagine the room, imagine the room. You are in the abdomen. You have uh, a double coated paint, right? All right, it's double called curtains, double curtains in your in your in your in your room. The curtain that is closer to the wall is going to be the parietal. The one who is closer, more inner, close to the internal organs, are going to be the viscera. Between the parietal and the viscera, we have again 30 ml, 30 ml again of fluid in between to the, to do what to decrease the friction. But there is one more thing I want to tell you about this. So you are in the peritoneal cavity surrounded by the peritoneal membrane and you what do you want to be okay let's do you are the liver you are the stomach you are the intestine so you are in this room and you see the curtains there the the visceral layer are going to continue not only stay on the wall but they are going to be covering your body too you are the liver you're covered by the visceral by the visceral layer of the of the peritoneum. If you are the intestine as well. So all these curtains are coming to you and surround every single organ inside the body, inside the abdomen. You okay with that? Yes. Yep. Okay. The last part, what time is it please? Oh my God. Can you give me, okay, so, all right. So let's finish this. All right, so there is two ways to, let me see here. Uh, I'm going to make a shortcut. My God, Harvey, where are you? Okay. So we have two ways to divide the abdominal area. Okay, so please pay attention to this, okay? All right, so here we have the four quadrants. We have the four quadrants, four quadrants. And here we have nine regions. Nine regions. All right, so this is highly asking the exam, okay? All right, so number one, what is the, how do you divide the four quadrants? The four quadrants are going to divide like this, sagittal and transverse. What is the cross street? The cross street is the navel. So visualize that in your abdomen. So tra trace a line transverse on the umbilicus and mid sagittal. So now you divide the four quadrants of the abdomen. When somebody is telling you pain, you have pain, show me we Listen, write down this, listen to this. This is the very basic medicine. So when you ask a patient and you start acting like a nurse, so when you ask a patient, where is your pain? The question, universal question is this. Don't forget ever. 
can you point with one finger where is the pain? That is the way that we need to ask, to ask. Because if they put the whole hand, you don't know where is it, where is the pain located. So they, can you ask, tell the patient, can you show me with one finger where is the pain? And I will teach you a trick later on because you don't have time if you want to stay late, a little bit later, five, five minutes more. So that is, they are going to point here, they are going to see this quadrant. How we mention these quadrants? These quadrants are going to be, if you remember your anatomical position, this is the right. This is the right. This is the left. And this is the left. The right, we're going to see upper, upper quadrant. Here we have the right, is not upper, it's going to be lower, right? Lower quadrant, R-U-Q, Q, Q uh, R-L-Q. What is going to be this? Left, what? Left upper. Upper quadrant. And this is the left? Left lower quadrant. There you are. So that is the and uh, the denomination of all these quadrants. You okay with that? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, let's go to the nine regions, and I will tell you why we need, we need to know this. I already basically tell you, but I'm going to add more. So here we have the nine regions. The nine regions are divided here. This is the umbilical navel, so it's not, the navel is not anymore the cross street here, so it's a difference. So here we have the clavicle, and the clavicle, you trace a midpoint in your clavicle, and you trace a horizontal line here, a vertical line, sorry, a vertical line. Same here. You, you determine your clavicle here, go to the midpoint, and that is called the midclavicular line. I'm not going to ask that, but I'm telling you where it's coming from, these, these numbers. Then we have touch your ribs. The inferior border of your ribs, go to the side here, the inferior, that is where the most inferior portion, you trace a transverse line, so below the ribs. And here you try to touch your upper, the, the highest portion of your pelvis bone, the, the pelvic, pelvic bone, you're going to trace a line here again. So we have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine regions. Nine regions versus four here. Okay. So what I want you to remember about this is this. Once you already have your, try to practice in your, in your family, friends, whatever, you can use your dog, your cat as well, all right? Okay, so here we have the right hypochondria. This is right and this is left. Right hypochondriac region. Hypo means below or low. Hypochondriac means cartilage. Which cartilage? The costal or the rib cartilage. So that's why this is below the rib cartilage. We have the right hypochondriac region. Right hypochondriac. Sometimes we call right uh, we call hypochondrium. It's the same. So don't get um, I mean confused on that. Hypochondrium and hypochondriac are going to be the same the same the same denomination all right so now we have right hypochondriac if we have right hypochondriac you have a left hypochondriac region now below that we have the right lumbar 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 means at the level of the vertebras lumbar area so that level i'm not saying that the vertebras itself the level and this lumbar are going to be called sometimes flank. Flank. You need to remember all these names. Flank or lumbar region. Lumbar region or flank. If we have the right flank or right lumbar region, you have the left lumbar region. Easy. You need to remember hypochondria, flank. Then we have the iliac fossa. The iliac fossa is this area. The iliac fossa sometimes is called, and you need to know these two, the inguinal region. Inguinal region is the same to say iliac fossa. 
or iliac. You don't want to say fossa, don't say fossa. It's okay too. Iliac is enough. Right iliac or the right inguinal region. If we have right, right iliac, right inguinal, you have a left iliac, you have a left inguinal region. You okay with that? So we have hypochondrium, lumbar, and iliac. Hypochondrium, uh, lumbar, and iliac. Well, okay. All right, so we okay with this? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. Now, here we are going to see in the center, we have the easy one, the umbilical ring. The umbilicus is where is the navel. So the umbilicus is here. All this area is not a cross like in the in the previous. Is all this region is the center of the of the nine regions, umbilical region. Now, umbilical region, we have here on the top we have epigastric region, epigastric region. The epigastric region is going to be epi above gastric stomach. So at the level of the stomach. So that is the epigastric, a, a hook when they're boxing, right? A hook on the epigastric region, right? So they're going to basically be uh, somewhere in box, but when you somebody's box. Epigastric, so and the opposite will be having the hypogastric. Hypo means, means below, low, under, right? It's under the epigastric. Epi means above. Where was the epicenter of the earthquake? Right? So how superficial, what, how higher, close to the surface is going to be the uh, epigastric, right? The epicenter. epicenter. That's a word that we use, right? Hypogastric below the epigastric. Okay? All right. So the purpose of this, and with this I finish, is that, well, there's one thing, two things, three things. Four things that we need to finish. So here, this is question for the exam. In the right hypochondrium, we have the liver. The liver. I'm going to give you the most, not most important, but some of them. I give you the Christmas tree, and later on, you're going to, we are going to use the decorations for the Christmas tree. So the liver is located where? In the right hypochondriac region. Question for the exam. In the left hypochondrium, we are going to have the spleen. The spleen is in the right hypochondrium. Then we have in the right lumbar area, right lumbar area, going up is going to be the ascending colon. I know you're familiar with colon. Ascending colon. And the other lumbar region is going to be the descending colon. In the, uh, here in the iliac fossa, you're going to have the appendix, right iliac fossa. You need to know where is the appendix. At this level, you need to, even at the beginning, you, know, you need to know where is the appendix. Where is the appendix? In the right iliac fossa. In the left iliac fossa, we have the colon sigmoid. This colon sigmoid is the piece of the colon that is before the rectum. Colon sigmoids is not rectum, okay? We have colon sigmoid and the rectum, so that is a different part. Colon sigmoid. Now, in the epigastric region, we have the stomach. In the umbilical region, we have the small intestines. In the hypogastric region, we have the urinary bladder. Female, the uterus as well. Okay. So that are the nine regions of the of the body. You okay with that? Yep. Yes. Okay. Number one, the questions are coming like this. Where is located the liver? The liver depends on the options. You can say the right upper quadrant, or you can say the right hypochondrial region. You know what I'm going to ask about the hypochondrial region. Okay? So, the spleen. 
The spleen is located in the left hypochondriac region. So, or you can say in the right, on the, uh, actually, why did I put the slip? Oh, spleen. It's going to be in the right and the left, sorry, upper quadrant. That is where it's going to be the spleen, right upper quadrant. Left upper quadrant. This is the right upper quadrant. All right. So here we have when you're talking about the um, or the area that is between the two regions and two quadrants, but you want to say stomach, you're going to see in the upper abdomen, middle upper abdomen, or you can say epigastric region. So we said epigastric. In medicine, we call epigastric pain on the epigastric region. It could be uh, stomach upset, it could be ulcers, it could be all the reasons. Okay? All right. So I'm going to ask you what is, what is in the right in the right uh, lumbar region. Or I can ask you what is in the right flank. In the right flank or right uh, lumbar is the ascending cord. What is in the left lumbar or left uh, flank? You're going to say that descending column. When I ask you what is the right iliac or right inguinal, is you're going to tell me the appendix. When you are telling me, when I ask you, where is the urinary bladder, where is the uterus? You tell me it's in the hypogastric region. If I ask you, where is the colon, sigmoid? It's going to be located in the, in the left inguinal or left iliac region. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That is number two. Number three. Number three is the way I'm going to ask you. So I suggest you to have to have a picture in your mind. Put a, a picture in your mind. Close your eyes and try to imagine all the regions. Because I'm going to ask you, what is superior to the umbilical region? And you will answer what? The epigastric region. Epigastric region. What is inferior to the umbilical region? Apogastric. Apogastric. Okay. What is superior to the right lumbar? Uh, the right. right exactly. Right hypochondria. What is medial to the left lumbar? The umbilical region. The umbilical region. The medial, medial to the Same. center is going to be the umbilical region. Okay? Everybody are clear or no? Please. Clear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Excellent. Now, what you're going to use when you are going to practice as a nurse, when you have a pain, the most common area the most way the most easy way is to local localize the pain in the uh, uh, in the four quadrants four quadrants very common pains will be liver gallbladder uh, kidneys is is another story stomach when you say stomach is the one of the I have cramps cramps diffuse cramps are going to be cramps is everywhere right sometimes it's a diffuse cramps but when you basically talk about the stomach Pain, you're going to talk about epigastric pain. That tells you a lot. They are even ruling out. Saying epigastric pain, it can be many reasons, huh? many things. It could be gastritis. It could be GERD, gastroesophageal reflux. It could be uh, nauseous and vomiting, uh, stomach upset. It could be a myocardial infarction, epigastric pain. So you need to use, when the pain is lo localized, below, in the center below, that is the epigastric region. On the sides, we have the liver, the bladder, on the right hypochondria. And the last thing I want to tell you is this. And with this, I completely finish. So we already agree that you're not going to tell the patient, tell me patient, are you having pain in your right lumbar region? And the patient doesn't know what you're talking about. So the patient said, I'm going to die or what? Right? So they don't know those terms. So you need to ask the patient, and you don't going to tell you, do you have pain in your epigastrium or in the upper portion of your abdomen? That is not a way to ask. You're never going to give the answer to the patient. 
You never give the answer to the patient because the patient is going to tell you yes, 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 yes. And the last thing is to ask the patient, can you show me with one finger where is your pain? And that is where they are going to direct the pain. Okay? You okay with that? All right. Yep. So let's go very quick to the mat. What is Matt doing? Kilograms to pound. So this is simple. We already talked about oh feet into feet into what? Into inches, right? That is a homework today, right? Right or no? Yes or no, please? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So now you you are going to do the homework and we are going to tell you how to do it. So for example, in uh, let's say five feet six inches i want to change it into centimeters feet is the same to say like this right and inches are going to be like this okay so this five feet six inches so you need to do the conversions first conversion you need first of all you need to change feet you need to make a plot the plan is going to be to change feet into inches and inches into centimeters. Conversions to be needed to be need to be known. Conversions are going to be one feet or one foot is equal to 12 inches. And one inch is equal to 0.54 centimeters. You okay with that? Okay. So you have five feet. Five feet, I need to turn, according to my plan, into inches first. So I know that I need to make the conversion. So I multiply by a fraction. Where I put feet? Below here. Because I want to cancel them. And what I want to see? Inches. So now I know that one feet or the one feet is 12 inches. Correct? Yes or no? Yes. 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 So feet and feet, goodbye. And that is giving me 60 inches. Correct? Yep. Plus, I don't need more conversions here because they're giving me six inches. So if I have 60 inches on here, plus six inches, you're going to make a summation. So you have at the end 66 inches, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Now, 66 inches are going to transform into centimeters. So I'm going to multiply by, by the fraction where I'm going to put inches below here because I don't want to see inches anymore. I want to have centimeters. And these centimeters you're going to know the equivalence that we talk here. One inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. How much is that? Somebody can help me. Somebody can help me. Okay. It's going to be 167 centimeters. Okay, you okay with that? Yes. Easy, right? Very easy. All right, so if you have questions, just text me. And uh, I don't know if you have time for the review and all the, we are going to do a, a review for the next quiz. All right, so let's get to start. This, this is not mandatory. Eh? If you have things to do at two o'clock, you can go. But uh, definitely, is this is not a mandatory for me neither. <clears throat> this is an extra time I provide to you. Okay, <clears throat> all right. So let's get to start without delays. If you leave, just tell me bye. Okay, just for by courtesy. Okay.
Because what about if somebody, everybody leaves? I'm talking to myself, so I want to. We're still here. Okay. All right, so uh, give me 10 seconds. Five seconds. Three seconds, two seconds, one second. Okay. Okay. So what I what I want you to be careful for this next uh, next quiz is that I'm not going to ask you exactly what is the definition. So what I'm going to ask. What I'm going to ask in the options, what is not true about the definition? That is a little bit higher difficulty than ask you direct questions. So for that, you need to practice in your mind what is the concept and what is not the concept. And you need to read the options. Do you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, all right. So we have, for example, a... Just a moment. Uh, we have, uh, for example, the fat is what kind of uh, of uh, of uh, bond. What is the what kind of bond is going to be fat? We have ionic and covalent bond. What is the best example for ionic bond? Well, ionic bond is um, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, that is the salt. Excellent, right? Don't forget that, please. The best example for covalent polar, water. The best example for covalent no, no polar, fat. You okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. So for this, you're going to have, for example, if I ask you what is hydrophobic reaction, you will tell me fat. What is hydrophilic reaction? You tell me the you tell me uh, the water. And, water. And what is hydrophilic is the sodium chloride. Okay. Yes. All right, so uh, you need to remember, I want you to remember what is organic and inorganic. What is the concept to di differentiate a substance that's organic versus inorganic? Se uh, second, what are the most important, the six components of, uh, of our body, say, the main six elements in our body? John P. remember that? Oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, right? Yeah, Chomps P, right? Excellent. So, carbon. I, I, yeah, I got, uh, got oh, only yeah. four. Oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and then? Carbon and hydrogen. Carbon and hydrogen. Okay, got it. All right, so we have the uh, monomers versus polymers. When you're talking about polymers and monomers, you know glucose what it is a monomer or polymer monomer monomer what is amino acid monomer amino. or polymer amino is polymer amino acid is a monomer Mono is the monomer of the protein. Amino. Okay? Yes, amino acid. Fatty acid is a monomer or, or polymer? M monomer. Monomer. Yeah. And nucleotide? Say monomer. Monomer. Okay, good. Monomer. Okay? So that that is something I will tell you. I want you to realize this. 
This is the first level of learning. What is the first level of learning? Is to understand. See? If I make you take that quiz right now, probably you understood, but you cannot answer the questions. Right? So that's why you need to study. What means study? Is you use your memorization. You are using your IQ to understand. But IQ is not enough if you don't have enough memory. Okay? The computers are not going to be uh, efficient if you don't have a good RAM memory. Okay? So the memory and intelligence coming together. So that is going to be the second level of learning. So you're in the first. So you need to study three hours every day in order to of, of fix the information permanently. Okay, you okay with that? So it's not enough just to take the exam because I, I took the, the class. You need to study. This is not, this is not CPR. Okay, <laughs> the CPR, at the end, everybody wants to have, everybody wants to have 100, right? Okay. I mean, the guy who is teaching, everybody needs to be 100. That is not really academic. It's not possible to have everybody 100. I get me 100. So, all right, so please, all right? So just remember, that is yours, my suggestion. I'm telling you, I have many years teaching, so please follow, 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 um, follow um, a suggestions, please. It's up to you at the end. But at least there is somebody who is telling you things, okay? And that's my purpose. I, I don't, well, anyhow. So now, we have here the nine regions. I want you to take a picture and put it in your mind, put the stickers, put it in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the microwave, in your plate, whatever, but need to be learned very well for next exam. Same for the four quadrants. What is the upper right quadrant, right, left, superior, okay? In the abdominal cavity, we are going to see different organs. All the internal organs you have in your body. What do you have in the abdominal organs? Abdominal organs will have the uh, liver, gut bladder, the kidneys, the intestines, the pancreas. There is many more, but the aorta, IBC, that's what I mean. But you just need to remember what, which belong to the abdomen, which belong to the thorax, which belong to the, to the dorsal cavity. Dorsal cavity belongs the brain and the spinal cord. Thoracic cavity be belongs the mediastinum, where is located many structures of the thorax. Okay. I want you to remember what are simple and compound molecules. We all right. Yes. All right, so that is a very narrow review, and uh, definitely I want to focus on that. But you know what? Your responsibility, and you are paying your money, don't waste your time doing something else. No, now don't do emergency parties, please. No emergency parties. No emergency parties. You need to study all these 1,570 hours. Dedicate your life exclusively to study. That is going to give you the reward that you need for yourself, not for me. It's for yourself. Right? Okay. All right. That's all. Thank you so much. I will see you Tuesday, no, Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, professor or doctor, I have a question for um, homework two. There's no option for us to upload it on Moodle. Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you. Just a moment, please. Just a moment. I'm going to go on that right now. Thank you for letting me know, Marcel. Let me check because, yeah, that is the help I sometimes I need. So I, I really very in the right moment. All right. So quiz two, medical device. Okay. 
Oh. Ah, ya este momento, ya este momento, ya este momento. So the the time will be today. The the due for this homework will be Wednesday 13. Okay. Oh, no, this is open right now. This, uh, I'm going to close this. It's going to be closed. Oh, uh, it's going to be no, open. Uh, 0, 0, 002, 11 today, 0 hours, 2013 is going to be closed at 23.59, uh, 11.59. So today is the due date for homework number one until 11.59. All right, so we have here and then voila. Uh, love your homework here. I'm going to make it more evident here and over there. And then to the right, just to tell you that it's part of it. Okay, thank you so much, Marcel. All right, so how was the lecture for you, Mr. Eric? Eric, Eric, how was the lecture for you today? You learned something today? Are you happy? What can be better? What do you want me to improve or what do you want to improve? <clears throat> no, I, I think you uh, thoroughly explained, like, especially the regions. Uh, I got a better understanding of like the nine regions, and uh, I think like it'll. Be, I think it's helpful for you to tell us to like practice on like family and whatever. Yep. So uh, I think that's just overall it was good. I understood like basically most of them. So I just gotta like you said study. You know, if you're going to do that, when you when you're going to do that, you can understand what the nurse is doing. And you can do it on your, you can start doing that. So yeah, this is the first step in your assessment of nursing. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Shani, Sh Shani, right? Shani, I pronounce right? Yes. Shani, what is your opinion? Um, it was, the, the lecture was very thorough um, and, you know, providing the pictures and just doing a breakdown of everything that is on the lecture helps a lot. So I wouldn't change anything right now. No. Oh, that is a very good compliment. Thank you so much, Jamie. But definitely always you are learning. If something to improve, we are there. Okay. I'm trying to be, well, try to be perfect in everything I'm doing. I'm better. Always is a space to improve. Always a space for errors. Always a space for improvement. Okay, Miss Nant, uh, yeah, probably we can talk a little bit after class, but how is the lecture for you? Your microphone is off, Miss Nant. The lecture is good, um, but, uh, but okay. I'll talk with you later, yes. But, okay, but about the lecture itself? Yes, the, 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 the lecture is okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. Marilyn, please. Um, yeah, I agree with my fellow um, classmates. It helps that you break down the pictures, especially the quadrants and stuff, instead of just reading it, that you broke it down and said which was in which area, which organs were in which area was helpful. And that is coming for the exam, open eyes, open ears, Marilyn. Okay? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. If there is anything to improve, always be ready to tell me, please. Okay? I'm very open on that. Huh? So I'm not getting upset or something. Uh, for me, it's actually good because if I make something, I would like to make it better because every group is different. I need to adjust. Your group is different personality from previous groups. And every group is having different personality. So I want to adapt to that situation. Thank you, Ms. Marie. Mr. Daniel, please. Uh, everything was good. I haven't I haven't dealt with the nine regions in a long time. I've been doing patient assessments for a while, just using the quadrant system. So that was a uh, that was definitely nice. 
Okay, excellent. So, yeah, I, I'm, re, I'm going to rely on your experience. I'm going to rely very soon on your feedback and your participation there. So, yeah, I think you're going to nourish our, our group very much. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, Miss, a wrap up, please, Miss Marcel. Yeah, everyone said pretty much uh, it was straightforward. Um, the lecture images were helpful. Um, I agree with Daniel, the um, nine regions, it's good to go over it because I, I was seeing um, the four quadrants all the time and not much of the nine regions. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Um, all of you, thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoy this class as much as I did. And uh, you have uh, contact me anytime. Don't forget your medical terminology. You start to do it. Don't wait until the end of the course. Because at the end of the course, you want to be focused on the final exam. You don't want to do my medical terminology. So do it at least one week before. Complete one week before your final exam. In order you to be focused on the final exam. It's very, I'm telling you, many people regret not to do it. So do it. Try to do it ahead of. Just put it out of your plate. Finish that. Memorize that. But I'm telling you, there is in the midterm. I'm telling you ahead of time. We have three components. There are going to be some medical terminology in the in the exam. Okay. Uh, there are going to be. A math, math that we read, uh, did so far is not going to be probably a few questions, one or two questions of math, and the rest in didactic. You okay with that? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The midterm basically is going to be, to tell you an idea, midterm questions for a medical terminology is about what you should have until the middle of the of the class, at the middle of the of the course. Okay. So it's not going to be medical terminology that is coming in the last part of the course of medical terminology. It's only what is coming from the first part of medical terminology. Okay? But I give you, I don't want to tell you, okay, every week you need to do medical terminology. I want you to decide yourself in your own pace. But before the midterm, you need to finish basically the first part of the medical terminology. That is going to be very kind of, very helpful. Okay? So um, for the midterm, it's just the quizzes. Right? Uh, excuse me, sorry. It's just the quizzes that we have to do on Moodle. Yes, for yeah. medical terminology, that is on your own. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. So thank you so much. Thank and you, I will, stay, I will stay until the end because somebody wants to talk to me or not. So always I used to stay until the end. So for the rest. Muchas gracias. Que tengan buenas noches. And uh, I will see you on Tuesday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Yeah. Yes, Minan. So what's yes. going on? Um, I tried to log in on uh, the one you sent me with the, the password, but I haven't tested yet. Th th that is the first things. And after I lo log in, because I cannot practice um the whole, I cannot do the homework, and then I cannot practice the lecture too, uh, because I cannot log in. In Moodle, you cannot log in Moodle. Yeah, I try to I try to log in uh right now. In where? Then, in, in Moodle or JG? In Moodle. Okay. So that is neat. I cannot help on that until the student services are going to make you officially log in into a Moodle, Moodle exam. I send you yes. the enrollment key. I send, I saw that you have yeah, access to the, Moodle. But yes. if, yes, not, the one you, if you, you don't send have me, that, the, you cannot, yeah. you cannot put the... You cannot put a Roman key. That means that you don't have access yet for Moodle. So that means that I cannot help on that. It's not because I don't want it. It's because I can't. It's not in my power to do it. So that is should be done by student services. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, doctor, let me, uh, let, be, let me try. So what time? Will, what... It will be a pleasure for me to go.
Okay. Okay. So what time can I call you back um by today? I I I will try uh the password and I will also ask uh the password from the office too. Um you know. So I will suggest you to go to the school and ask student services to help you one on one. Okay. Because this is online they they're not going just to try to make an appointment with them. Okay, student so, services. Okay. So, student service, you call Gornick Academy? Yes. And you go to uh, press zero. Press zero. You press push zero, zero, okay. And they are going to pass you directly to the, uh, to the front student desk. Service? The front, front desk. desk. In the front okay. desk, when the, somebody's answer you, you're going to ask if somebody can uh, put you in the uh, transfer the call to student services. Okay. 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 Thank you, Doctor. So Lisa, what time Lisa, can, Lisa, I, uh, can I Lisa, call Lisa, you Lisa, back? Lisa, 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 yes. Lisa, Lisa. So if the student services, you call and nobody answer, you hang up and you're yes. going to call again the school. Okay, so they're going, to, you're going to call the school, you press zero, you're talking to the operator, and you will say, nobody yes, answer, I need some yes. help. Somebody can help me, I am from the LBM program. Yes. Okay, all right, so that okay. is it, yeah. all right? Okay, thank you, doctor. So um, uh, what can I call you back by today? What for? What is the reason? About for? Because um, after I... um. After I can uh, go through to your class, um, I might have some question to ask you. Yeah, I, I'm teaching all day, Miss, today. So I, yeah. I have very book time. So can you yeah. do just a, probably when you have access to Moodle, when you have access to Moodle, because yes. I, can help you, I can help you after you have access to Moodle. Yes, so I, yes. I cannot help you before because... It's not in my power to do it. Yes. Now, yes if I, I will understand. be able to do it, I will help you. But I cannot. Yes. I cannot really, literally, I cannot do anything on that. So yes. when you go Moodle, text me or call me. Text me better. Okay, I'm going to text you. So so you can uh, you can text Tell me back what time is your available, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Okay. After I get it, uh, I can set up everything, and I I'm going to text you. <laughs> yes. Yes, Miss No. Okay. No, yeah. sorry. Yeah. All Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you, you, Doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, what is your background? What is my background? My background in America is nothing. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> you know what? What I was thinking, Mont? I was thinking you have uh -huh. a medical you have a medical background. Um actually uh I am I never work uh, at the medical fee. This, this is the first time I have been working medical fee for three years. Like um, the CNA, you know, you already know oh, that. Okay. This is here. But I graduate my I graduate with the chemistry in my gantry. I get the I have the bachelor of chemistry, bachelor of science. Okay. The major so is chemistry. You are science yes. first. Okay, so that's good. Yes, that yes. That is going to yes. help you a lot. So that's why I was... Yeah. Suspecting. You have some background. Some background because <laughs> you can answer yes. questions. That's but, yeah, but, you know, I'm I'm surprised myself when I, you know, learning facts, those um, uh, chemistry uh, subject, I stay, you know, stay memorized um, some of those things. You know, I have been... After I graduated, I never worked with the, the chemistry. Okay. Tell me, are you My from major? Yeah, yes. I came from Burma. Burma, Myanmar. Burma. Oh. Yes. You know Kay Kaylee? It is, uh, Kaylee? Uh, who, uh, where, where, where do you live? You live me where? Here? No, where do you or... live? Yes, Utili. In America? Oh, no, what city are you coming from? Oh, Yanko, Rangoon City. Rangoon City. Oh, Rangoon City. Rangoon. Yeah, because Yanko, they, have, yes. they have a community of Burma people, like a club in, in Pleasanton. Oh, uh, yes, yes. You, you, you went there? 
No, I never been there. Yeah, but there is a big community of Burma. I know a student of mine. He has a very yeah. big community of Burma. Yes. Yeah. So yes. there's in Burma. Yeah. I never, I never tried so far the food of Burma, but I will try some. Nice country. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Thank you so much. Um. Uh, I don't know. It's nice or nice country or not, but but uh, you know the leaders are not really nice. That's why you know most of the people ran away from the country. I see. That's why I am here too. 